Field hockey, Uganda, and an adopted little girl. What do these three things have in common? We'll explain on this special edition of Game On, and it's coming your way right now. The accomplishments of the Liberty Women's Field Hockey Program since its inception in 2011 have been staggering. NCAA tournament appearances, top 25 rankings, and All-American, the accolades are numerous. One of the reasons for their success can be attributed to a trio of sisters, but their story goes much deeper than what you see on the field. Their story begins with a young couple in Northern Ireland. Still up for grabs, backhanded shot, good for Natalie Barr. She's got Sometimes the difference between winning and losing can come down to a single decision. For this couple, a single decision changed more than a game. Well, we met uh, at Queen's University in Belfast originally. Um, I suppose we didn't know each other because we came from the same small town uh, in Northern Ireland. Very quickly, we, we, we did sense and feel that, you know, we were meant to be together. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we talked in terms of sort of plans to go overseas. Mm -hmm. It was something that we both felt that that was right. And the other thing we talked about, which we, we laugh about now, is we, we talked about having no children because we felt having children would actually hold us up so. in what God had planned for us. And, mm -hmm. and it's laughable now when you see the story and the way uh, the way things did pan out over, mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and certainly, you know, you can look back and, and we, we ultimately can laugh at it too. Say we had originally planned no children, but then uh, we, we had our first child, uh, David, and he was born, and Rebecca, our second child. And we decided, after David was born, we decided if we could manage it at all, I would stay at home with the kids, because we felt that was so vital. But we thought, if I'm home with the children, why not uh, do some fostering at the same time? Because I'm going to be home anyway. And I had seen such a need when I was working on social work. Yes, we prayed about it, but we thought, let's, let's just give this a go. Let's push the boat out and see what happens. And we did. Charlene was born with cystic fibrosis. Abandoned by her parents, her first year of life was spent entirely in a hospital, waiting for a home. She became our daughter. <laughs> as soon as she came, came into our home. I, I think in this we only would have had the courage to have taken her uh, on a short-term placement because of the fear, could we manage? But looking from this point, I don't ever remember from the day she came into our home no. that in our hearts we didn't want her to be there forever. They tell us about the, even the time that they brought her home and David and me were on either side of her. And she cried the whole way home. And mum and dad couldn't understand why. She just cried and cried and cried for such, she was so bubbly from the first moment they met her. And they switched the light on and immediately she just stopped crying. And they realized she had never been outside of hospital. She had never seen darkness or experience with the incubators. And you know, the nurses were amazing to her, but she never had, you know, a family member to properly hold her and to care for her. Charlene had such, um, you know, she was an individual and God had amazing plans for her as well, so. Little did we know the plans that God was setting in motion uh, when we went down the route, the route of fostering, because it changed our whole uh, life totally, and our children's lives and our lives. Yep, and even Charlene was starting on the ground. And is there stuff in it? Well, I haven't set the boot Rebecca? I was second oldest, so um, there was David and then there was myself and then Charlene and Natalie and the twins. So it was always um, a mixture of fun and it was always so busy. The household was never, there was never a dull moment. I had five younger sisters, so I was the firstborn and it was quite funny growing up actually because if you were looking at it from the outside, you might have thought it would have been hard, but they were always brilliant for, Charlene included, just doing things like playing football or, or soccer would be here. Shelley never wanted special like attention or special um, consideration. She always just chipped in along with us. Charlene never played the sick role either. You know, she was still doing everything we did, even though she was maybe a wee bit behind us. She tried to do absolutely everything. As we grew older, we started to realise the implications of um, cystic fibrosis and the effect it had on her. Shalene has such a positive attitude, and especially with Serena me being her younger sisters um, and Natalie as well, she didn't like to show us when she wasn't feeling well. So every time you asked her, how are you? 
was like, oh, I'm fine, I'm good. And if you're like neutrally not, she's like, no, I'm fine. She didn't want any sympathy. She didn't want, especially with us, she wanted to act strong in front of us. Um, and I think especially then, we didn't really, because we were so close to the situation, we didn't really see the deterioration until you took a step back and saw six months ago she was here, now she's here, you saw the complete drastic step. Um, and I think a lot of the time I denied Shalene's ill health because I didn't want to think that she would ever not make it. Just it broke your heart seeing Louise soul and knowing she'd been through so much. And I think from very, very early on, we said to each other, she didn't have anybody in the first year of life and we want to be there for her at the end of life. The Barr family welcomed Charlene into their home, prepared to meet the physical needs of her cystic fibrosis. But as she grew into her teens, emotional pains and hurts surfaced that would affect the family to even a greater extent. There was dark days in our household. Charlene made it very difficult for us to love her at times, things she said, things she did to us. Um, especially, I think David probably found it the hardest was when she would have hurt me or Bethany and Serena being um, the youngest girls in the house, David found that really hard. It was almost just like there was a switch sometimes where she would be saying the nicest things, completely at peace, but joining with everyone, and then it was just like a switch flew behind her eyes, like somebody else was there, it wasn't Charlene anymore. Her eyes would just go dark, and the most incredibly painful barbs would fly from her mouth. Charlene was dealing with a condition called attachment disorder, uh, which was linked very, very closely to that first year of life, where there wasn't one person who was caring for her. She would be violent at times. Uh, she was small because of her illness, and yet, you know, you could see just the, the, the anger within her. I remember where mum and dad were in the kitchen nearly in, in tears after what Sean needed to say, and I went into her room, and she was crying. Sean was just crying at that point, and she looked up, and I said, hi, Sean, it's me, it's Dave. And she said, she was crying, she said, Dave, I don't know why I say these things. I don't know why, I don't mean them. I don't know what I'm saying. Why do I do these things? Surely you're all going to give up on me. Because her mum had rejected her at birth, she felt it was easier to push us away so that we couldn't reject her as well. The other five of us couldn't comprehend that, but we tried to gather around her and love her um, because she was our sister. But Shirlene often would have pushed us away. And that was very difficult to take because how do you love someone if they don't want to receive the love? The fact is you loved her dearly, but you saw a pain she was inflicting on everyone around her. And it wasn't just verbal, sometimes it was physical things. It was really, there was three or four years, it was horrendous as Shani wrestled with her identity. You know, so many times, you know, as a family where we really cried out to God because, and prayed together just because Sharon just pushed us away time and time again and had so many battles to face inwardly and that she struggled as well to surrender to God. Um, she had given her life as a child to God, but she definitely really struggled in those few years. While Charlene was stretching the family's limits, God was preparing them all for a bigger purpose. I had been involved in a non-profit organisation and I had an invitation to go to Uganda uh, and to adapt the programmes into the context of HIV prevention. I was able to take David, I was able to take Rebecca on some of the trips and it was all around primary and secondary schools. Uh, but I so much wanted to take the whole family and I kept saying to Janice, we will have to go out to Uganda as a family. At this time, alongside it, just shows how God knits everything together. There was a knock on the door, and um, a gentleman who we wouldn't have been friends with, it was just more an acquaintance through the hockey actually, um, knocked on the door and said, um, handed mum an envelope. He said, I've been praying, and I, like, no one knew that our family wanted to go to Uganda. This is the amazing thing about it. But he handed the check to mum and he says, I've been praying and I feel God wants you as a family to go to Uganda. God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. Our God is a Going to Uganda changed all of us, but in particular it changed her line. Watching her there, she was taking heart in things. She, her relationship with the kids was incredible. She met kids who were orphans, who I think in some ways she could identify with the kind of the difficulties of them having lost parents or being sometimes abandoned by parents and so on and she bonded with them incredibly. Watching her from a distance, seeing her eyes light up with some of the kids, seeing their eyes light up and just her laughing with them. She was, she was brilliant there, absolutely brilliant there. The whole process is of whenever Sharning came home, she was, and it started to dawn on her, you know, if I was born here, 
I wouldn't have survived. People, you know, kids have to walk miles to get to school. And it was almost like after Uganda, the light came on for Shalene and she realized all these children are orphans and they're not acting like the way I am. Many of these children are ill and they're not acting the way I am. And it was just like her whole perspective of life changed. God did bring healing to Charling. And, you know, as we often said, we always, always wanted physical healing for Charling. And we believed that God could completely heal her body of cystic fibrosis. Um, however, if there was a choice, as we always say, if there was a choice between physical healing and emotional healing and where she was right with God, we would always choose the emotional healing. And that is way more important and way more eternal in the grand scheme of things. So, yeah. On the heels of Charlene's emotional healing comes some devastating news that takes the family's purpose and influence into an unexpected place. I'm a 1993 graduate of Liberty University with a business degree. Uh, grew up in Florida and I had some friends who would graduated a couple years ahead of me that had come to Liberty. You know, my parents were very strict when I was growing up and I grew up in a home that um, our faith was very deeply rooted and we were in church and I went to a Christian school. And so even with all of those good roots in place, my parents were worried about where I was going to go to college. I was accepted at many secular universities as well as Liberty and they were very concerned about me going away from home, still being so young. And and once they visited here and got the spirit of what's going on here, they completely signed off and felt like it would be a great place to send their 17-year-old daughter, who really had not ventured out into the world that much. They thought, great place for you to get an education, but to be rooted deeply in your faith and have a chance to grow in that, it was the best place for me to be. And they were very comfortable that I would get everything I needed, not just you know, one dimensional. It's not just about your faith and it's not just about education. It's not just about friendships. And there are programs for every line of study for just about anything that you would want to do. But at the same time, you're going to meet people from around the world. You're going to go through experiences that challenge and deepen your faith. You're going to hear from some of the best pastors and speakers and singers. You're going to have experiences you wouldn't get anywhere else. It was really about all of those things. And when they realized that it would really check off everything on their checklist, they signed on the dotted line. You're invited to College for a Weekend at the largest Christian university in the world. This weekend is all about you and your future. Come experience college life and everything Liberty University has to offer. Live on campus for the weekend and attend classes, ski, snowboard, or tube down snowflex, and cheer on the Liberty Flames. From Division I Athletics to professional theater productions, we have so much planned for you. Register today at libertyseafall.com. We are the storytellers. The game changers. The freedom fighters. And the melody makers. We are a university that doesn't just graduate scholars. Any college can do that. We train champions. From all fields of study. And all walks of life. To be influencers on a global scale and make a difference for God. So here's your invitation. Here's your invitation. Your invitation. To the largest Christian university in the world. Words shared in a locker room like this one can sometimes be the difference between winning and losing. But in God's economy, victories sometimes come in the way we least expect. The Barr family would experience this firsthand in the life of Charlene. Charlene Barr had gone through a lot in her life's journey. She had been abandoned at birth with an incurable lung disease, then adopted into a loving family in her teen years, she struggled with abandonment issues and anger, only to be renewed with a trip to Africa and inspired by children whose struggle she was all too familiar with. Now, as Charlene hears her worst news yet, her new perspective brings an idea that changes everything. 
She always had ill health. She was in and out of hospital all the time, but her health really started to dip. And shortly after she came home, she was told by her consultants that she was going to need a double lung transplant. My sister Charlene, she never, ever got down. I'm, I'm never got down, never let her illness defeat her, ever. But this was the first time I remember ever seeing Charlene struggling and she was so downer. I remember her lying on the table with her arms crossed and her head down and that was hard for us to watch because normally she was the strong one for us and um, whenever she faced obstacles in her health and we as a family faced obstacles in our health because we faced everything together as a family. We talked together, everybody in the family was, was so shocked and we just sat around the table and, and we asked, you know, God, how can this be? It was a very difficult time and it was, all, it was just like a dark cloud around our table, no lie. And it was almost just like a light bulb had come on in that instant. In that instant, she just perked up and she's like, I know what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a school for children in Uganda. And we were all like, it was like the awkward silence, you know, she's lost her mind. Um, and, and Dad was like, what do you mean, Charlene? And um, she's like, I'm going to build a school for children in Uganda, for children who can't go to school. And she's like, if I'm not going to be able to go to school, well, I'm going to help others go to school. You know, it wasn't what am I going to do, uh, you know, my life could end at any stage. It was, you know, what am I going to do because I don't want to sit around at home and do nothing. Within a matter of moments, it was a case of her eyes lit up and it was, wasn't the Charlotte that had been five minutes before. It was completely different persons where the light was again in their eyes and she was just really smiling, talking through, her hands excitedly moving. And we tried to almost bring in some realism into the, the situation. But, but she had got the bit between her teeth. She had this and nothing was going to turn her. It went from like the mood being down here till we were up here. You'd have thought we were having a party and celebrating something. And we were celebrating something because that was the moment God led, that God led his plan for her life on Charlene's heart. Charlene would set a target and every time it was way beyond anything like, like was even possible. But every time without fail, that was raised by that time, if not above. Darlene would have broken many rules along the way uh, with regard to best advice. Um, on two occasions, she propelled down high buildings in Belfast to raise money. On one occasion, she came out of hospital with intravenous lines in her arm. Nobody would have been aware that day that she had just come out of hospital to come down a tall building on ropes. She was incredibly plucky. The people of Northern Ireland, especially young people, got behind her and I think it was because they realised what a big heart and what a vision she had and um, what a selflessness she possessed. I want to help make a difference in the lives of those children who have so little. Thank you for helping me achieve my dream. God bless you. She raised £120,000, which was way nearly double what we'd originally set out for her to, to raise. Charlene's dream for the children had become a reality. But this joy was bittersweet. Back home, Charlene's health had taken a turn for the worse. I remember the machine stopped going. Dad got it sorted and, um, and I remember it started going off again. And this time it didn't stop. And um, I just remember Rebecca screaming for Dad and Dad came in. And Dad obviously knew that Charlene was taking her last few breaths. So. He gathered all of us, my papa included, um, into the kitchen and we were all like beside her as she was lying down. And um, we got to pray with her and talk to her. And I remember like, we even like joked with her, even though like she couldn't respond, we all like got to joke with her. And um, it was honestly like, she was, like my mum says, like it was just her eyes were so big. She was looking at something in the distance um, and we're convinced that she could say God because we were all saying, Shalene, I love you, I love you, but she couldn't hear. She was just, she had such a peaceful face. And the way that um, where the sofa is, um, we have glass around it and it was almost like she was just looking into the garden with these huge eyes. It was almost just like Jesus was just saying, come home. She was going to something greater. She was going, she was being called home to God and the bridegroom was going to the groom and we just take peace in that. You know, I know for a fact that she sees, she sees the skill now and that she is in complete peace now and she I means she's no more pain and that's more than what we could ever ask for. I'm so, so glad that Shalene was given to me as a sister and I had the chance that I had and the time that I had with her and 
I wouldn't trade it for anything. And while at times I'm like, I wish I had longer, I know that that was God's plan for her life. And I can't question God because he's above us all and he knows more than I do. But I'm just thankful for the time that we did share together. With regard to the struggles, you know, they were so painful. But that same fight yeah. was what carried her through her final illness with such determination and carried her through all her efforts to make a difference in Uganda. And she finished her race so well. So well. But Charlene's story is far from over. When we return, we take you to Uganda to see the growth of Charlene's project and see how her dream continues to flourish. For other parents considering a program, I'd highly encourage them to uh, uh, talk to the advisors, uh, to, to reach out and to learn as much information as possible. This is a good decision. It's one that we came through. If there are a family that's considering doing this, reach out to Liberty University. Um, they've got excellent advisors, excellent counselors. The literature is fantastic. It's clear communications, and um, I know that they will learn everything they need to do uh, to make this decision for them. One of the neat things about LUOA is that even though it is a virtual environment, it's amazing to have the support um, from the staff back here on campus. And it has given um, our family such an excitement as we're walking through the high school years to really see that there's a goal and a purpose um, in really doing well in your education. And both of our kids are really seeing the value of owning their education and LUOA has been such an integral part of that that I can't um, thank them enough for everything that they've given to our family. I'm an adventure filmmaker. I really strive to tell stories that inspire others. I chose Liberty University Online because of its flexible scheduling. Um, I knew I wanted to do an online program, so it supported that lifestyle. Uh, and I also chose Liberty because it's an established school. I really wanted something that had that notoriety with it. I would say to someone looking to study online through Liberty University that you really need to look at if it's right for your lifestyle. I don't think online schooling is right for everybody. I don't think living on campus is right for everybody. I really am a strong believer that you need to look at your passions and desires in life and you have to compare those um, and see if that's really what's the right path for you. Now I'm graduating with my degree in business entrepreneurship, and I can't wait to get out and change the world. Cystic fibrosis may have taken Charlene Barr's life at the age of 20, but her legacy continues to thrive through Charlene's project. Her vision of helping children in the country of Uganda continues to grow and aid those in need. In the world's eyes, Charlene was often overlooked, but God sees more than meets the eye. Perhaps it's no accident then that the first school they built was called Hidden Treasure. You can see it vivid with Chinese story. She never lived to see the dream happening. And I remember when we had news that Charlie just saw the pictures of the braided land, but now she has passed away. Because of her seed, we are influencing over three 
120 kids in the community. So we see a seed that is dying, at the same time life growing up. When the school was built, this tree was planted to honor Charlene. On this day, its single bloom testifies to the new life thriving there. We as a family I thought it was just so special and um, that the first school was going to be called Hidden Treasure um, because Shirlene herself was a hidden treasure. So weak and so broken on the outside but something so special inside of her. How God used that and God became that special thing inside of her to, to basically change a village in the middle of nowhere in Uganda. It isn't just the Barr family that visits. Hidden Treasure frequently hosts mission teams like this one which happens to include coaches from the Liberty University field hockey team. Eyes up, eyes up. Whenever the kids see the Liberty team coming in, they are so excited. And one thing they think about most is the hockey playing, the sports, and the great fun they always have whenever the, the Liberty team comes. For all of us, we can look at the masses problems in the world, the injustice, the fact of so many who don't know Jesus yet, our own countries that look and we think they're so far from God and think, what can I ever do? I'm one person, I don't have the skills, I can't speak, I can't do this, I'm so useless at these things. But God chooses people that are completely and utterly to the world's eyes, ordinary and nothing. He sees that hidden treasure, he sees that the potential that they have and he uses them. And that's what he did with Charlene, someone who from the world's eyes was nothing. She was so special to us, but in the world's eyes, it was nothing. And he, because she gave, gave that little that she had, opened her heart to God, opened her heart to others, that hidden treasure has been revealed, as it were, in Uganda. <laughs> we actually find that it's, it keeps Shirlene in the family, it keeps her alive, and um, it makes us feel like whenever we go out to Uganda, we're going out to see her, because we're seeing the children, we're seeing um, Shirlene through that. I remember after Shirlene died, someone said to us, I can see Shirlene dancing with the children in Uganda up in heaven. Shirlene is at the minute celebrating, you are grieving and that is understandable, but at the minute Shirlene is celebrating in heaven. Despite the fact that Shirlene had to die and despite the fact that a seed has to die, it's the way things happen and it's just, um, that was God's plan for Shirlene's life and we just take peace and know that because of it, there's a school out in Uganda, there's children getting an education, and there's children coming to know Christ. Hallelujah, Lord, I bless your name. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah, Lord, I bless your name. Charlene's obstacles were many, but she never used them as excuses. Her legacy lives on because she saw a need and simply said, what can I do? You know, maybe that's a question we should all be asking.